Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Gretchen Crosby Sims, the Executive Director here at the Institute of Politics. Uh, we are very pleased to welcome today Stephen Perlstein to campus uh, to discuss his new book, Can American Capitalism Survive? The copies of the book are going to be available for signing and purchase um, at the back of the room after the program. I wanted to mention a few upcoming events. Uh, next Tuesday, CNN contributors Al Cardenas and Anna Navarro will be talking with David Axelrod about the future of the Republican Party and the midterm elections. Wednesday, Jeff Weaver, campaign manager for Bernie Sanders in 2016, will be discussing his new book on that election and how the Democrats will fare in 2020. Sorry, 2018. Um, you can, and probably 2020 as well. Um, you can find out more about these events and other events at our website at politics.uchicago.edu. In case you haven't heard, there are some elections coming up. And at the IOP, we believe that voting is a fundamental responsibility of all citizens. This fall, a group of students is leading a uh, drive called UCHI Votes, to a nonpartisan push to boost voter registration and turnout on campus. If you want to make sure that you're registered, you can find out early voting dates for different states or look for a nearby polling place. Check out their website at ushivotes.com. You can also learn about the early voting location here on campus at Reynolds Club, which will be open October 31st through November 2nd. You can do same day registration and voting. And for more information, again, go to ushivotes.com. Uh, audience questions. We will open up the floor for um, questions from the audience. So during the conversation, if you hear something of interest, jot it down, make a mental note. Please be ready with your questions at the end. Um, we will have a microphone that's roving throughout the room, so just raise your hand. As usual, we'll give priority um, for the first three questions to students, and we remind you that questions end with a question mark. Um, we uh, have restrooms on the first floor. Please make sure that your phones are on silent. And now to formally introduce our guest and our moderator is Olivia Padilla. Olivia is a second year from Cassville, Missouri, studying public policy. She's very involved with our civic engagement program uh, at the IOP as a member both of the Women in Public Service program and New Americans U Chicago. Please join me in welcoming her to the podium. Thank you. Good afternoon, and thank you again for that kind introduction. It is my pleasure to introduce Professor Stephen Perlstein for today's event, which will discuss how and why the promise of American capitalism has deteriorated over the last 30 years and what that means for its continued existence. Professor Perlstein was raised in Massachusetts and graduated from Trinity College in 1973. He began his career in journalism working for two local New Hampshire newspapers, then, after he moved to Washington, D.C., he worked as a congressional staffer and television reporter, was founding publisher and editor of the Boston Observer, and worked as senior editor at Inc. Magazine. He joined the Washington Post in 1988, and in 2003 began his business column, where he wrote weekly about various issues. In 2008, he was awarded the Pulitzer Prize for commentary for columns anticipating and explaining the global financial crisis. And in 2011, he received a Gerald R. R. Loeb Lifetime Achievement Award. He visits us now from George Mason University, where he teaches as the Robinson Professor of Public and International Affairs. Professor Perlstein is here to speak with us about the issues which he addresses in his latest book, Can American Capitalism Survive?, wherein he challenges and asks us to reassess some fundamental assumptions of modern day capitalism, namely that government should have a minimal role in the market and that corporations are only beholden to their shareholders. Leading this discussion is Jonathan Levy, associate faculty member at the law school and professor of US history at the University of Chicago. His research focuses on the history of economic life in the United States. Please join me in welcoming Professors Perlstein and Levy. Great, thank you, Olivia. Good afternoon. Um, it's a pleasure to welcome uh, Stephen Perlstein here to the University of Chicago. Welcome. It's great to be here. We are, we're going to talk for a while, and then we will have a, a period for question and answer. So I know with the issues, uh, you might be excited, but you know, please hold your questions and I'll call on you and we'll have a, a period to, to talk. I guess I wanted to start, this morning the Labor Department released the latest statistics on job growth. It was a bit bef below the expected forecast, but nonetheless, unemployment is now down, I think, 
I believe, to 3.7. Lowest since the 1967, I think. Lowest since the 1960s. Um, even wage growth at the bottom of the distribution, finally the last year or two is starting yep. to budge up. And of course, the stock market's been booming for, for nine years now. So, so why this book now? I mean, can American capitalism survive? Uh, it's somewhat of a pessimistic question. Sure. Uh, so at this moment, reading the newspaper headlines, um, why did you write this book? Uh, well, uh, a couple of things. Um, thanks for doing this. But, um, uh, first of all, it wouldn't have been my choice um, of book title, but uh, <laughs> that's always true. If anybody has ever written a book, you know, um, uh, these things are done by committee. And the reason I didn't want to do it was because I was, uh, I was afraid of that question. Mm -hmm. But now I anticipate that question, so that's what gives the book a certain tension. You know, we're 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 at a, at a time when the economy appears to be doing as well uh, as it has in recent memory. Um, we're also, uh, just think we're only 30 years since capitalism sort of defeated communism and we're only about 25 years since the United States economy, which you, all of, most of you weren't around in the 1980s, but people were worried about the U.S. economy in the 1980s. There was all these blue ribbon commissions and uh, committees worrying about our competitiveness and that we were going to lose out to Japan and to Germany. And uh, we turned things around uh, in the late 80s and the 90s. Um, so in many ways, why would you ask this question? But um, I'm going to turn that around to you and say, why is it that so many of you young people, when asked in polls, do you support capitalism, more than half of you say no? Why is it that 57% of Democrats uh, today um, say they're intrigued with the idea of socialism, even though they probably don't know what socialism exactly is, but um, they're intrigued with it. There's something about our system, notwithstanding its success, particularly for uh, you know many of us, including myself, um, why people are uncomfortable with it. And it has to do with the feeling that our form of capitalism, which is a little different than capitalism in places like Japan or Germany, uh, or Sweden, that our form of capitalism has run off the moral rails, that it's somehow lost its moral legitimacy, um, that it causes my students at George Mason University when I ask, okay, who, who here wants to go work for Goldman Sachs or a, you know, a big, big profit-making company, you know, and a group of 25, maybe one or two will sort of somewhat sheepishly raise their hand uh, knowing that it's a little bit socially unacceptable to the others in, in the classroom. Um, why is that? Uh, and it's because uh, it feels a little grubby. It feels like it's, it supports the kind of values uh, like ruthlessness and selfishness and greed that they don't particularly like and that it uh, uh, downplays other qualities which they think are good. Uh, they think it's unfair. Uh, and so we're wrestling with that question, uh, the very question that you asked. How come if everything's so good, we feel ba so bad? So what, I mean, one of the things I really appreciate about the book as a historian is that it frames present problems in a historical narrative. So, so something went wrong. I mean, I actually agree with you. But when, when did it happen? Why it happened did it happen? in the mid-80s. Mid yeah. um, and, uh, you know, there are some... There are some very specific th things that happened in terms of uh, Wall Street exerting a lot of control over American business in the mid-1980s um, through a process known as corporate takeovers, uh, which were financed by these new things called junk bonds. Um, we don't need to go into that. The previous decade, from the mid-70s to the mid-80s, believe it or not, was a lost decade for investors. An entire decade in which if you sort of invested in the broad stock market, you made no money. And in fact, on an inflation adjusted basis, and by the way, back then we had really serious inflation. On an inflation adjusted basis, you lost money. Um, and at the end of that period, um, basically, Wall Street said, you know, enough is enough. Um, these companies are losing their global market share. They've become fat and happy, and we need and our economy have become uncompetitive. And we need to make it competitive again. And they were right about that. 
but they, exert, they began to exert a control over businesses and the business culture that was um, useful for a while based on a set of ideas that were somewhat true. And in the 30 years since, they've pushed it way too far. Um, they've succeeded and they've gone beyond succeeding it to the point where they've now undermined, laid the foundation for undermining our long-term success. And so that's when it happened. It was a, it was a, it was a healthy response to a problem. Uh, we embraced some ideas and then we pushed them too far. One of the ideas related to this that you talk about in the book is the idea of maximizing shareholder value and corporate governance. So I want to talk about that and maybe even get a little bit into the weeds somewhat about how that works, or at least how it's come, come to work, as you say. But first, we're here at the University of Chicago. Yes. And in 1970, an economics professor at the University of Chicago named Milton Friedman wrote an article, actually it was published in the New York Times Book Review, I believe, Called, magazine, magazine. Magazine, thank you. Called the social responsibility of business is to make profits, I believe. So what is that idea and what's your, what's your critique of it? Um, well, uh, it certainly is consistent with um, his view. Mm -hmm. And again, in all of these things, there's a germ of truth. Mm -hmm. We have a capitalist system, a market system, and it's based on the idea that many of you read about and maybe if you read... Adam Smith, uh, Wealth of Nations, um, that if we all pursue our individual self-interests in a competitive market system, that not only do we improve our own well-being, but through the magic of the invisible hand, we are led to improve everyone's economic circumstance. That's the magic of capitalism. And so someone like Milton Friedman, who embraced that idea uh, wholeheartedly, um, uh, has pointed out that this is a system that over the last uh, 300 years since the Industrial Revolution has lifted billions of people around the world out of a basically subsistence poverty where they had been for millennia. And this is a system he could point out today if he were alive that is still lifting billions of people out of poverty in places like China and India and that sort of thing. So what could be more moral than that? And why divert... Um, companies from this mission of, in their case, maximizing their self-interest by maximizing the self-interest of the people who own the company. So there's a germ of truth there, a large germ of truth. The problem is that it's something of a flawed uh, understanding of Adam Smith, and it's something of a flawed understanding of the law, and it's a flawed understanding of how capitalism works. So let's go to Adam Smith. Adam Smith actually was a very nuanced moral philosopher. He wrote a book before he wrote The Wealth of Nations called The Theory of Moral Sentiments. And in that book, he made it very, very clear that um, although we pursue our own self-interests, it won't work, markets won't work, and we won't be happy unless we also care about the wealth and the happiness of everyone else, that to some degree we're all in this together. Adam Smith understood that. I think that's the part of Adam Smith that for some reason Milton Friedman didn't read. <laughs> um, and it's an earlier book and, um, uh, and it's quite a good book. But legally, there are a lot of people um, who are directors of big corporations, who run big corporations, there are a lot of people who teach finance at business schools like the one here. Um, who actually believe that the directors and the executives of a corporation have a fiduciary duty, that's a legal duty, punishable if they don't do it, punishable to them if they don't do it, to maximize the value of the shareholder's return. In fact, there is nothing in law that says that. That's a fiction. It's a myth that's been perpetrated by people who want it to be true and is imposed on, at least by this consensus, on all companies. In truth, you can form a corporation for any legitimate legal purpose. I can form a corporation for nonprofit purposes. I can form a corporation to enhance the public welfare. I can form a corporation to maximize my workers' pay. 
I can form a corporation to maximize the enjoyment of my customers. Any of those is legal. And if any of those is legal, then it is not true that the people who run them have a fiduciary duty to maximize shareholder value. It's also, um, it's also uh, true that the people who are shareholders of a public corporation are not its owners. You probably think they are the owners, but they are not. And this is very well established in corporate law and in Delaware case law. Um, the corporation owns itself. That's why corporations have rights, like the right to donate uh, unlimited amounts of money to campaigns. They are a corporate person. Nobody owns a corporation. And the, f the duty of the, fit of the directors and the executives is to the corporation, to its long-term sustainable survivability. Um, so legally, it's a fiction, even though it's taught as if it were true, uh, as I say, by most business, uh, business school finance professors. Um, and a lot of corporate, uh, and it is enforced by Wall Street analysts who insist upon it. It's, it happens to be enforced by a lot of corporate general counsels who tell their executives, well, if you don't do this, we'll get sued by shareholders, which is probably a true statement. And you can win those suits, but if you don't want to have those suits, if you want the cost and hassle of defending those suits, uh, then maybe you want to sort of accommodate that. And it's also enforced by sets of compensation schemes that basically give a lot of encouragement to executives and directors to hew to that line. They'll make a lot more money if they can drive up the stock price. Uh, they'll become much richer, and so they behave in that way, not surprisingly. They respond to incentives. Um, but if you talk to CEOs, and I have over the years, they hate this. They would rather run their companies the way their predecessors ran companies in the 1950s and 60s, which was, we have an obligation to the corporation, its long-term survivability. We have shareholders. We have to make sure they're well taken care of, but we have employees. We have customers. We have to make sure they're all well taken. We have to balance these interests uh, in order to run a successful corporation. Um, and it was only in the mid-'80s we, we, we trans transferred from a what was basically called managerial capitalism, where the managers did this balancing, to what's known as shareholder capitalism, where shareholders are first. Uh, and there's so much first that over the last uh, 30 years, although companies have become more profitable and more productive, almost all the benefits of that increased productivity and profitability have been siphoned off in favor of the shareholders and uh, the executives who are major shareholders. I, I say that with a little asterisk. A lot of the benefit has also gone to consumers in the form of lower prices. But they certainly haven't gone to the employees, the general employees, the, the frontline employees of companies who are res at least significantly responsible for that increased productivity. I want to talk about, you just talked about inequality, really and how the link between this shareholder capitalism and inequality has evolved. But first, I just wanted to draw out a few things that, that you said, which struck me as exactly right. I mean, first, you began with emphasizing morality, culture, value. Something went wrong there. And your point about um, corporations and their fiduciary responsibilities proves that exactly. So there's no law right, that says that corporations have to maximize shareholder value. Rather, something changed in kind of business culture since since the 1980s. And then second, I mean, I see so many students in the room, and I haven't been teaching that long, but I've been teaching for some time, and I see it in students. When I talk to them about career choices, what they'd like to do, often I'll, I'll hear, well, I'm thinking about um, going to work in Wall Street, going to be a banker, or I might go work for a philanthropy that's going to try to solve poverty once and for all uh, in some other country. And so this sharp split between either being a rapacious capitalist or being a saint that walks on earth. And I always think, well, what about the middle? You know, what about um, that space in which Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations and Moral Sentiments comes together? You know, makes sense. Trust, cooperation, um, forming the basis for a, a more moral capitalism. Anyway, stock buybacks. 
I, I said we get a little bit into the weeds. Maybe we can try that way. But it seems to me the practice of corporate stock buybacks has been very prominent recently, especially since the Trump at all uh, time tax highs. Cuts, all, all time, time highs. highs. Billions and tens of billions of dollars being spent by companies to buy back their own shares. Yeah, kind of manifests these problems and these trends. So can you talk about what is a stock buyback and, and how is it a driver, or if not a driver, at least a reflection a lot of the of a lot of the problems that you're talking about? Well, I want you to stop me if you think I'm getting too much into the Okay, weeds, okay? all right. Um, companies um, why do companies want to buy back their own shares? It's essentially like slowly privatizing your company so that eventually there'll only be a few shareholders if they keep going like this. Why, why would a company want to do that? Well, if you think about it, if you're a company that has a lot of profits and you don't, and you don't think you have anything to do with the money, what are you going to do with it? Well, you would think, well, OK, then you would, ex you would distribute it to the shareholders. The shareholders are entitled by the way, to the dividends of the company. But if you send the money to the dividend, if you send the, the dividends to, uh, to the shareholders, you send the sh profits back to the shareholders, they get taxed uh, on it at a certain rate. And they have to pay the tax in the year in which you send the dividend to them. But there's another way to essentially get money back to the shareholders. And the corporate community believes that this is a more efficient way to do it. It's certainly more tax efficient. They also think it's more efficient for other reasons. I can buy back my shares, some of my shares. I spend this cash to go out in the open market and buy it from whoever wants to sell it to me. Usually, in, the, in a market like this, while the price is going up, while the price is near its high. So you might think, well, gee, why are they spending the money to buy stock at its high? Well, that is sort of dumb investment. but. They do it because it drives up the price of the shares. Why does it drive up the price of the shares? Well, just in simple economics, they've increased the demand for the shares and reduced the supply of the shares. So if you increase demand and reduce the supply, then, the, as you all know, the price will go up. The other reason is because in, on Wall Street, the stock price is, in a broad sense, a reflection of a multiple, a multiple of the profits times the standard multiple in Wall Street at any one time. So stocks are selling at 15 times earnings. So if you reduce the number of outstanding shares, by definition, you are increasing the profit per share because there are fewer shares. You've, you've monkeyed around with the denominator uh, enough so that it has the effect of increasing the share price. Now, why is this better for investors? Well, because if they want to take their profits, they can sell their shares. The price of the, the stock went up. That's a way of taking a profit. I can sell it, and I can pay the capital gains tax on it, which is the same as the dividends tax. But if I don't want to pay taxes right now, I don't want to take the profits, I can just take the increased share price. And, and until I sell the shares, I don't have to pay, um, I don't have to pay the price, the, the tax. Um, so that's why they do it. Uh, and not surprisingly, the executives who have a lot of their compensation tied to the stock price, they think this is fantastic. Um, what the problem with this is twofold. Number one, maybe they could have invested in their workers and their training. Maybe they could have invested in new machinery that makes the company more productive. Maybe they could have invested in new products. Uh, uh, but they don't do that. And number two, and this is somewhat surprising to most people, a good chunk of these stock buybacks have been paid for with borrowed money. Borrowed at a time when the cost of borrowing for large corporations was pretty close to zero. And so they have increased their debt in order to do this. Um, and so they have essentially weakened the long-term prospects of these companies because they're not reinvesting to the degree they should be, really. Uh, and they are borrowing money which, at low interest rates, which someday soon won't be so low interest rates, and then they'll have to take some of their profits and rather than continuing to invest in the business, use it to pay higher interest rates to the people from whom they borrowed money. So that's why it's not I such mean, it a it strikes idea. me, I mean, if you disagree with this, jump in. It strikes me that, that, that what we have, when we think about incomes, where are incomes come from, we typically think of wages, salaries, compensation. But increasing share of the growth of income now comes from 
assets, securities that appreciate in, in markets. Right. So the and share can, of the national income going yeah. to people who earn it by salaries and wages has gone down over the last 20 <coughs> years. Whereas the share of national income going to, going to people who own financial assets or real estate has gone up. And, and so we've divided the pie differently between labor and capital. That's the kind of capital like Karl Marx would call capital. Um, and, and that's, we've, we've had, a, 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 after many years of that being a very stable relationship, it's now gone significantly in favor of capital. So one of the things the book does, I think uniquely, um, a lot of books written about inequality, it's a very important political topic, but it really shows how these changes in corporate practice, corp corporate governance are, are part of the rise of inequality the last 20 to 30 years, really since 19, 1980. So let's talk about inequality. Yeah. Um, well, what's wrong with inequality? Well, it's a good question. Uh, after all, w w capitalism sort of assumes that not everybody gets paid the same amount at the end of the year. We don't have a kibbutz here. Uh, and you need, the in a, you need some inequality. In fact, you need quite a bit of inequality to provide the incentives that a market economy needs in order for people to take risks, to work hard, to improve their skills and their education and take the risk of doing that and, and invest the cost of doing that. That all those things are necessary to give the right incentives for this system to work and for it to be in innovative and entrepreneurial. Um, and so you do need a high degree of, the, uh, of inequality for this to work. Um, but what happens if things get too unequal? So let me ask you to imagine um, a, a continuum. And on one continuum, you have the kibbutz. Everyone, no matter how hard you work or how much risk you take or don't take and how little work you do and how little training you give yourself, you make the same thing as everybody else. That's one extreme. Now take the other extreme. Imagine an economy in which no matter how hard you work and how much risk you take and how innovative you are, you'll only get a subsistence wage, basically enough wage so you don't die. And all the surplus from the economy that's being created goes to three families. I think we all know from history and we all can just intuit logically that neither of those societies and those economies is going to be a very high growth economy. So we know that the sweet spot for growth, for a growing economy, is somewhere in the middle. Now, where it is in the middle, we can have all sorts of debates, but we know it's neither of those extremes. Um, and we sort of know, in, in terms of talking about advanced countries like ours, you know, we know from the late 90s. Uh, from France and Sweden and Germany, that they were on the wrong side of that sweet spot. That they were too much equality, not enough inequality, and as a result, they weren't growing very fast. And so most of them have made changes to move sort of in our direction toward that sweet spot where growth is at the highest. And I think what we know um, and there's pretty good evidence of this, the IMF has said so, that we are on the other side of that sweet spot. We've gone too far in the, in the direction of inequality and that in fact, we could have more equality and more growth both. That there's not this trade-off that sometimes market fundamentalists want us to believe is an absolute trade-off in all countries at all times. We can actually have more growth and more equality because we're on the wrong side of that sweet spot. We're too, I'm sorry, we're too close, I got my directions wrong, we're too close to that three family, that extreme of three families getting all the surplus. Um, and we can go a little bit more toward equality. Our pendulum has swung too much the other way. Does that answer your question, John? Yeah, I mean, there's a trade-off, clearly, an economic question, the trade-off between growth and inequality that you handle well in the book. But I also was wondering about politics, since we're at the Institute of, of politics. politics. Equality is one of democracy's um, primary political values. Well, it's uh, of ours it is. Of yes. ours, or at least so far, so far, so far it is. And when you talk about the problems in the economy that have come out of more inequality, uh, lack of trust, lack of kind of social cohesion, it makes me think about how those problems have manifested in, in, our, in our politics. So do you think the rise of an inequality also has had 
political consequences, consequences in addition to economic ones as well. Well, I, it has, yeah. but I don't think I would separate those two things. Mm -hmm. The reason why a good social scientist and economist, and why the economists at the and IMF have said this, the reason why our economy may be underperforming in the long run is because if you have too much inequality, ordinary people have the wrong incentives. If you work for a company where no matter how hard you work, you're going to get paid the same subsistence wage, you're not going to work very hard, you're not going to take risks, you're not going to come up with new ideas, you're going to be like in the Soviet, uh, in a sense like this, it's just no different than in the Soviet Union. You don't, you don't want to work hard. So what we see today is a declining um, growth in productivity, a declining worker engagement in their, in their behavior. So that's one reason that you don't want to be too unequal because you don't have the right incentives at the workplace. But another reason for too much, why too much inequality is bad for the whole system is that people start to get distrustful of each other. They start to get distrustful of institutions, distrustful of their employers. They start being unwilling to compromise and to cooperate with each other. And all that stuff is known as social capital. And when social capital declines, one of the things that happens is your government becomes more, your politics becomes more polarized and your government becomes dysfunctional. Does that ring a bell? Does that, seem, <laughs> does that seem like we might have observed that in recent years? I think so. Well, what happens to a country whose government is dysfunctional because its politics is polarized is that you cannot respond with new rules and regulations to changing economic conditions, to changing technology. You can't get bills passed. You can't have an immigration policy. Uh, you can't have uh, an antitrust policy. You can't have good copyright policies and patent policies. Um, you can't pass a budget. You start spending a lot more money than you take in every year. Does that sound familiar? Um, and then your, your economy starts to deteriorate because you don't have the rules and the regulations and the political infrastructure to keep your economy vibrant. And people then start to sort of feel like, well, if I'm going to start cheating. And so you have companies that say, well, okay, I'm going to give up my U.S. citizenship and I'm going to become, you know, a Bahamas corporation and I'm not going to pay all that U.S. taxes that I used to pay. Okay, well, that's the taxes that companies use, uh, that companies rely on to educate uh, their employees and to uh, guarantee their patents. Uh, and to provide a world order that is peaceful. You know, wars aren't really very good for business. Uh, and uh, to provide the basic research on which my products are based and uh, to provide the roads and infrastructure and ports through which they get their goods to market. Okay, well, if, if one company says, well, I'm not going to pay my taxes, then the other company says, well, if they're not going to pay, I'm not going to pay either. And then you start having people not paying their taxes. In fact, you wind up having individuals not paying their taxes, like the President of the United States. Okay, well, if he doesn't pay his taxes, why should I? And now, we're, now we get to be like Greece and Italy. And those governments don't work, and those economies don't work particularly well. So do you want to go down that path? That's why social capital is necessary. We need to trust and cooperate with each other to have a successful democracy and you need to trust and cooperate with each other to a, to a high degree to have a successful market economy. Um, and that's the danger of going down this road we're going down. Great. So I'm being conscious of our time. I want to turn to talking about solutions. Ah. Um, the easy part of the, uh, <laughs> the, the conversation. Uh, you have a chapter at the end of the book that, that lays out some concrete proposals. One of the ones I wanted to bring out was basic income, um, which in the past has been considered a quite radical, uh, radical proposal. And for a book that poses the question, can capitalism survive? And I think you want capitalism to survive. Yeah, I'm survive. a capitalist. Yeah, you want capitalism to survive. To recommend a basic income I, I, I was surprising for me as I read the book. So could you talk about uh, the policy, your thoughts about it, how they've evolved, and, and the best way, because you have a, a particular take on it. I do. The best way to implement uh, implement such policies. So when I started to think about solutions, I, I said to myself, 
I've been doing this for 30 years. There's, there's almost no new idea in public policy, okay? It's very hard to come up with a new idea. Every idea someone has suggested sometime in the last 100 years. Um, and unfortunately, I've been around so long that I am I, I'm cognizant of all of them. So, uh, But one of the, th every idea I thought of is, is, I kept thinking, how is it that I can come up with ideas that reinforce social capital, reinforce the idea that we're all in this together? So here is my proposal. Say basically that every citizen gets a dividend every year because they are an American citizen, because they have inherited a system um, that their f people who came before them created that makes our country richer than most other countries. We have a legal system, a political system, we have a set of natural resources, that we all inherit this and we, we all are, because we're citizens, are entitled to an equal dividend from this system every year. And because this is the United States and because we, we have this long going thing about welfare, I, I said, and we would give an additional dividend to people who work or who people who go to school. And then when I say every person, I mean every person, including a child, gets part of this dividend. So that's the universal basic income part. It's, it's technically, if you care about these things, a negative income tax, because in truth, I would take this money back from people who earn more than, you know, 60% of the medium wage, uh, medium income in the United States. So in fact, if you were like me, you get this dividend once a year, but then I would, I would essentially have to pay it back in higher taxes. But it's important that everyone get the dividend and we get it at the same time because it's a sort of a reflection of this idea that we're all citizens. But I would also make it contingent on one other thing and contingent on, on everybody doing national service two or three years during their lifetime. And I don't necessarily mean only when they're young. Sometime during their lifetime. So that we have a sense of mutual responsibility and also mutual benefit that we're all in this together. We all contribute and we all take out something. And we do it in somewhat equal fashion. So that's how I wanted to structure this universal basic income, which is uh, this income, by the way, this dividend, might replace certain programmatic progr uh, uh, payments that we make to people uh, or s to some degree replace them so that we could get rid of some bureaucratic programs. That's why conservatives these days like, you, like the idea of considered it, by the way, the same Milton Friedman like this idea, um, because it replaces a lot of bureaucratic programs, which are not a very efficient way to get money to people who might need it and uh, also have very bad incentive effects. Um, so that's another reason to do it. Um, and, you know, I've given a amount of money which is not a huge amount of money, but as you saw in the book, for any Anyone who was a working mom uh, or dad, a uh, single parent, at minimum wage, my proposal would raise them above the poverty line. If you didn't work, you wouldn't be below the poverty line. But if you, even if you worked at a minimum wage, you, you would be above it. And that seems to me to make sort of sense with our general sense that in a rich country like ours, nobody who works ought to live in poverty, and their children ought not to live in poverty. I'm getting signal, but I want to ask one more, just one more question. Uh, Does this mean that I'm, I'm giving too long answers? It, do, it, it does. It, it okay. means I only have one more question okay. before we turn it, out to, turn it back to the audience. Back to the audience. It, last month, uh, Senator Elizabeth Warren proposed the, I believe it's called the Accountable Capitalism Act right. about corporate governance. I think the main provisions, corporations with over a billion dollars of revenue have to have, receive a federal charter, and in that charter, they clear responsibility to a wide variety of stakeholders. 40% of the board has to come from votes from workers. And I think among other provisions, I think 75% of the shareholders in the board have to agree before a corporation can, can uh, enter political activity, enter politics. So let's, let's make you a senator. Would you, uh, would you support that bill? Would you vote for it? Senator Perlstein votes yeah. nay. Nay. Um, look. Um, the thing I'm complaining about is that Wall Street has imposed a one-size-fits-all mentality and mantra on the corporate sector, which is you must run this company 
to maximize shareholder value. They're the people that want one size fits all. And they have been pretty successful at it, I might add. I don't think our response on our side should be to that, oh no, we're gonna, we are going to impose a one size fits all solution on every corporation. I think what we should do instead is say, let a thousand flowers bloom. If some companies want to run themselves as rapacious profit maximizers, and they announce this uh, in their corporate charter, which they have to renew every three years, uh, then that's fine. But if some companies don't want to do that, if they want to be more like Google and only do good things, if you believe that Google only does good things, if you want to attract young people who don't want to work for such a rapacious company, if you want to attract customers who don't want to do business with such a company, you can have a different corporate charter. And you can say, I want to do different things. And if you follow that charter, then you would be shielded from lawsuits from shareholders who's, who said, well, wait a minute, you didn't maximize my profits. You can say, no, I, I told you we weren't going to do that. Um, and th let's see who wins. Let's see which business model works out best. So I don't want to respond to uh, one size fits all with a, with, with a liberal one size fits all. I don't want every company to have to act like they're Ben and Jerry's. Okay? Elizabeth Warren wants to make all companies do that. I don't think, this is America, I don't think they should have to. You know? But I don't think we should be all f be forced to operate, uh, march to that other tune, which is leading us down a bad path. Okay, I just want to say I like Ben and Jerry's. The ice cream is, is quite good. I like it too. Okay. All right, so there's a, um, please raise your hand. I'll call on you. There's a microphone. Don't ask your question until you get the microphone because we want to uh, record it. I see a red jacket on the wall right there, please. Hi. Um, so one thing that confuses me about rich people, and this sort of has to do with when you talked about uh, stock buybacks, is if they do it and then the value of their stock goes up and their net worth goes up, but they don't cash it out, what's the point of it all? And like in a similar vein, you have people like Jeff Bezos who are doing ethically troublesome stuff, so they have more money. But he already has $150 billion. Like what's in it for them to make these symbols go up if they're not actually cashing out their stocks and doing fun stuff with it? I don't get it. Okay. Well, it's a good question. So the first thing that you have to understand about rich people, and it's this thing, by the way, that the Milton Friedman's of the world don't understand, um, is that at that level, money is not useful so that they can spend it. There's no way they can possibly spend it. Okay? They, it's the way they keep score with each other. And that's why it's important. So having a lot of wealth, even if they don't sell the shares, is important to them. It's how they keep score. And ego has a lot to do with behavior at that level of, of activity. The other thing is that, you know, they, they live good lives. They spend plenty of money a year. They spend millions of dollars a year. They don't spend billions. You can't spend billions, but they do spend millions. Um, and then they have all this money left over. And what they really want to do is they either want to give it away so that they can be uh, uh, lauded and thought of as great people, or they want to pass it on to their heirs. And when you die, all that capital gains, you know, you bought Bezos, you bought the Amazon stock at zero, and now it's worth whatever it's worth, it's worth $10 billion, and you die. Upon your death under the current tax laws, that passes now without tax to the Bezos heirs, and they never have to pay the capital gains. They have what's called a stepped-up basis, and they inherit it at, for tax purposes, they inherited it the price it was at the day they inherited it. So if it goes from a 100 to two, zero to $200, their basis is now $200. If they sell it, they only pay the tax on the difference between 200 and whatever they sell it at, 250. They don't pay the tax on the basis of zero to 250. So there's a tax advantage for very rich people never to cash in until they die or their heirs to cash in until they die and then they avoid paying the tax. You hear a lot of conservatives say, oh, the inheritance tax is so unfair because it's a double taxation. We've already paid taxes on this money and now we have to pay a second inheritance tax. Well, sometimes that's true and maybe that part is unfair, but for most rich people, 
they've never paid the tax the first time because all of their wealth is in unrealized capital gains. So if you wanted, if you were a clever liberal Democrat like me, you would say, okay, let's get rid of the capital gains tax, let's get rid of the inheritance tax, but let's have no step up in basis. And if you offer this deal to Republicans at the Ways and Means Committee or the Finance Committee, you will be very curious to find out that they will not accept this deal because it's basically all the money you will have taxed with an inheritance tax is in fact unrealized capital gains. Um, that's a long answer to your question. Right here in the front. Hi, my name is Matt Enlow. I'm a recent alum of the law school. I graduated in June. Um, I have been really interested in the rise of people who talk about how labor is entitled to all that it creates, and maybe that's a position too far-fetched for you, but we've also seen since uh, the 1980s, like you talked about, a massive decoupling from wages and productivity. Productivity has continued to spike up over time, but wages have stagnated. Uh, how can young people take action to improve their conditions, given what you've talked about? Uh, as so much of it is tied to the corporations and the people who run them rather than the workers who are seeing these hard times. So you graduated from the law, uh, the law school here? Yes. So I don't know anything about how you did at law school, but I'm assuming that if you graduated from the University of Chicago Law School, um, you're a pretty highly educated and talented person. Um, you have market leverage. People, there are lots of people who want to hire you. Um, and if people like you um, start to make it clear that you're not going to work for companies that don't share their profits and their productivity gains with their employees, um, well, um, you're sending a market signal. And believe me, companies are getting that market signal. The aforementioned J Jeff Bezos just announced that he was raising the minimum wage at his company to $15 just this week, right? One reason he did that was because people like you, some of them, stopped doing business with his company. And more importantly, what he, I suspect, found was that he is having trouble attracting, competing with Google and Facebook uh, and other places in attracting people like you because you'd rather work for a less rapacious company that treats its workers better. And it is this competition for talent, and I would say educated uh, talent, hard to get talent, that is going to force companies in the long run to change the way they behave. So how can young people like you do it? It's just making those kinds of choices and making it clear you're going to make those kinds of choices. Um, and maybe making it clear that you're only going to work for companies that somehow you know, get the stamp of approval from certain rating agencies, not rating agencies like uh, Moody's and, and Standard and & Poor, but rating agencies that say these are good companies to work for and treat their employees well and their communities well and their customers well, and these are companies that don't get that seal of approval. And social media has sort of become a mechanism by which you might, we might sort of enforce those kinds of seals of approval and let other, everyone else know about that. And I think what you'll find is that companies are extremely sensitive to this, and including companies that in the past have said, don't tell me how to run my company, uh, like Amazon. Here, please. Hi, Professor Perlstein. Uh, Hi. My name is uh, Jacob Yellis, and I was, I'm just asking, uh, just going off of what uh, the other person uh, sort of cited is that our there, lawyer friend here yeah the lawyer friend uh there did has you pass been the bar by the way I did. oh good <laughs> uh, a gap has been growing between uh what workers are earning in terms of wages and salaries and uh uh their productivity and the area where they seem to break is 1978 and you know that's when you start seeing supreme court decisions like Bilotti, First National Bank, that sort of codify corporate personhood and that uh, corporations get to spend money in politics. This was formalized by Citizens United and McCutcheon. 
what, how consequential do you see corporate personhood in sort of uh, perpetuating uh, the system of economic inequality that you briefly mentioned before? Um, government policies um, in all sorts of direct and indirect ways have contributed to rising inequality uh, and the difference in, in uh, labor share versus capital share. Um, you can point to lots of them, antitrust policy, labor law, um, trade policy, uh, copyright policy, all of those have contributed to it. Um, but I try to discourage people like you from thinking that this is all the government's fault. Um, that something happened in the late 70s, early 80s, the election of Ronald Reagan and the passage of the 1982 Tax Act and Citizens United, which fundamentally caused this to happen. And what I would argue to you is that the fact that those things changed, those policy changed was a reflection of something more fundamental that they weren't the cause, they were a sort of an indicator of something more fundamental happening, which was a change in social norms, which is that rapacious, selfish behavior, which used to be socially unacceptable, became socially acceptable. And I wouldn't, I have policy prescriptions to sort of undo some of that stuff, but I would really focus on changing the social norm um, of what is acceptable behavior on the part of corp companies' behavior. Um, social norms are really important, and I can't tell you how they change. It's sort of a little magical thing. People actually are beginning to study this more. Used to be economists paid no attention to it because it, it wasn't in their models and they can't measure it, so they don't pay attention. They're starting to pay attention to it because it's important. And we have happening right in front of us a huge change in social norms, the Me Too movement. Whether you think it's good or bad, whether you think it's gone too far, that, that doesn't matter. It's obviously happening. It's happening in very real time, very fast, and it's changing behavior. Um, and I, I would urge you to focus on, on, on changing our social norms, changing what's acceptable. When you hear about somebody who is given a salary of $800 million and your first instinct is to say that's ridiculous, trust your gut on that, okay? And don't listen when people say, oh, that's very unsophisticated and naive and you shouldn't really have those, uh, those reactions. You should. Those are hardwired into your nature as a human being. Um, uh, and when you hear about companies uh, you know, treating customers badly or employees badly, not just because they laid them off, but because it was just insensitive and cruel uh, and, and unnecessary, unnecessarily insensitive and cruel. There's a, you, there's a reason you have that reaction and you need to, we, we need to go back to trusting those instincts. And I think that's where this change will come from. Once we have changes in social norms, then it will turn out to be very easy to change the laws and the rules and eventually you know, once people die off to change the Supreme Court um, uh, uh, rulings. But, you know, you can change Citizens United through a constitutional amendment, and I bet you we will in the next 10 years. Um, I, I think that's going to happen uh, because, you know, is it true that people with a lot of money have, are buying the political system and buying votes? Yes, that's a true statement. You won't get, you'll get nine out of 10 Americans to say it's true and it's bad and we need to change it. And we just need the confidence to have confidence in our own instincts to say, of course, this is a stupid way to run a society. And if the Supreme Court says, you know, the Constitution says it, well, screw the Supreme Court. We'll just change the Constitution. And uh, we've done it in the past. There are, what, 27 amendments, 28 amendments. Uh, you know, we can do it again. Uh, here, all the way on this side. Hi, Professor Perlstein. Uh, my name is David Hogue. I'm a uh, PhD student um, at UChicago's Department of East Asian Languages and Civilizations. Um, I have two questions. Uh, my first is, I think when a lot of people think about wage inequality and wealth inequality in the United States, the uh, impression or the impulse is to point to uh, tech companies in Silicon Valley that are sitting on a lot of capital and that have drawn in a lot of money. Um, but recently there have been sociological and economic studies that show that it's actually highly paid professionals, like engineers and doctors, 
and lawyers um, and financiers who are making, say, in the $500,000 to $1 million range in terms of annual income as being uh, one big factor in uh, income inequality in the United States. So how would you evaluate that factor? My second question is, um, so you had mentioned- Can we do one at a time? Oh, yeah, sure. Okay. So yeah. what are you saying? They're a big factor. Do you, so you say it's their fault? I wouldn't say it's their fault. It's just that when you have like a certain segment of a population that's making, say, 500000 to a million a year, yeah. um, and then- like I, and then you have people who aren't making that much, doesn't that translate into, and you have like enough of those people to create like a critical mass of, of, of wealth density in the certain segment of the population? Wouldn't why you then why say, are they making so much more while the others, why is the pie being divided increasingly unevenly? Uh, well, I think because those people are talented, they work hard, but there's also a kind of, um, a sentiment and say a, like a law firm that we want to have people who, who do their job well and someone who's going to be willing to put in like long hours. So you have a lot of labor um, being concentrated into one talented individual who then, you know, comes away with like, you know, a large income. Well, uh, I, I, think you, I think you need to learn to think a little more like an economist. And just keep asking the question, why? Why, why the law firm can pay $500,000, uh, why? Because it's losing money on it? No, because it can pass on that cost to its corporate customers in, and, bill, and bill that person at $1,000 an hour. And you say, well, why can they bill that person $1,000 an hour? Isn't, what's your name here? Matt. Matt would be willing to do it for, I, I bet, Matt would be willing to do it for $800 an hour. Uh, <laughs> Uh, or he'd be willing to do it for less than 500000 So what happened to the, com the competitive market that allows that? You, you, the, the language that you use is sort of the language of oppression. And that's a, something that young liberals have to learn to get away from. Most of the world is not about oppression. Those people who are earning $500,000 are not oppressing the people who are earning minimum wage. They're just doing the things you do in a market economy, which is I'm trying to get the highest salary and wages that I can, and I'm working hard to do it, and I'm part of a system, and I'm not, I'm not responsible for them doing it. But there's a reason why the markets aren't working efficiently that allow the law firm to charge that amount and to pass it on to corporations who pass it on to their customers, and that may have to do with antitrust law, it may have to do with labor law. You need to get to the underlying reasons why that's happening. Yes, there is an increase in, in demand for high-skilled workers. And there is not a, a, a concomitant increase in supply of high-skilled workers. That's why they can charge more. Why is the supply not keeping up with the demand? You've got to start asking those questions. There are, it's complicated, but to think of it in terms of oppression, that these people are stealing the money that ought to go to these people, um, that's generally not the way you have to, it's more complicated than that and it's important to, to, to figure that out and to talk about that rather than to frame it in the words, in the language of oppression, which is what people in global affairs departments tend to do, I have to say. <laughs> um, and I, and I'm, I'm really being serious. Have you taken a lot of economics? Uh, uh, yes, since I, in, as my undergraduate. I actually didn't intend to. Okay. Okay, you didn't, but it was sort of these people are the bad people yeah. that, are, that are taking things away from the good people. And I, that's not a, I, I, I just want to encourage you, that's not a useful way to think about it. What are the rules, what are the policies, what are the norms that allow that to happen? Because in a truly competitive marketplace, that shouldn't happen. In a truly competitive, open marketplace, people's productivity should match their, their, their income. Uh, and then the question is, well, why is that not happening? Okay, we have time for one more question. I believe I saw a hand. Yes, please. Uh, I'm a first year student at the college. I just wanted to ask, the rhetoric emanating from the White House at the moment um, seems to characterize the problems in our economy as a result of uh, threats from outside and, and um, basically unfair practices abroad. So do you, as a as an economist and as a columnist, think of these problems as like, do you give credence to such views or do you see these problems as just kind of internal, these, these corporations 
um, and their practices inside? Like, how much credence do you give to the views of outside influence being an issue? Well, I don't know whether it's outside influence. I don't even think um, our Nincompu president think it's an outside influence. He thinks that we made bad trade deals that hurt our country and our workers, uh, and uh, that if we had made better deals, um, we would have more jobs and higher wages. Um, that's an empirical question. Um, and there's not a lot of empirical evidence um, that overall it has hurt us, but there's plenty of empirical evidence that it, th that it has helped the economy generally, generally be by making cheaper products, cheaper, better products available to all of our consumers, but that certain people have suffered. So there's the overall benefit to consumers and the overall benefit to high-wage workers, like the ones cited by that gentleman over there, some of us who are, are, have benefited from globalization. So there are winners as workers, and there's lots of winners as consumers, but some workers have, benef have, 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 have paid the price. And, and so that is absolutely true. And then we have to figure out, well, okay, if it's good for the whole, but there are some people who've been left behind, how do we develop institutions so that we can compensate those people left behind? That's one question. Now the next question is, have we made stupid deals? And the answer is in general, no. But in the case of China, uh, we made a deal that probably wasn't uh, all that good. We assumed that they were a developing country and we allowed them certain freedoms as a developing country which now they're not so developing anymore. They're sort of half developed and we still give them those advantages. And they have manipulated currency and they, they, do, they do steal our technology. And we haven't enforced that. And so in that respect, he's right. Uh, and the only way sometimes to deal with a bully is to act like a bully. Uh, and he's good at that. Uh, and maybe he'll succeed or maybe he'll make things worse. But, it's, it's not a fanciful idea that, uh, they've take, that the Chinese in particular have taken advantage of us, like the Japanese did before them, by the way, in just the same way. And that got Japan only so far. And then the Japanese economy has, is, at a very high level, has sort of been flat for the last 20 years uh, because they pushed their system a little bit too far and we, res and we responded. It used to be that all the Japanese cars people were driving, the Toyotas and the Camrys and the Hondas, they were all made in Japan. And then we sort of threatened them with, if you, don't, if you keep behaving this way, we're not going to buy your cars. And so what did they do? Well, they put factories in Tennessee and Alabama and uh, South Carolina and California. And now most of those cars are made in the United States. So um, they're not taking advantage of us anymore. And we probably need to do similar things with the Chinese. Okay, well, I'm grateful uh, you brought us together today, and please join me in saying thank you uh, to Stephen Perlstein.